Well, if you can turn in your Bibles to John chapter 5, uh, just a note about the Apologetics Forum with Dr. Sarfati. Uh, he's going to be uh, playing chess uh, with 30 folks. I think we had the, the choice, this is not a joke, we had the choice if he would do it either blindfold or seeing. Um, that was the choice. He said, doing it blind, blindfold, it takes a little bit more time, you think, um, <laughs> right? But he will be, uh, he'll be seeing <laughs> this time. I guess he's done it. Photographic memory, really amazing. Anyway, John chapter 5, John chapter 5, and we are returning to verses 31 uh, through 40. John chapter 5, verses 31 uh, through 40, where Jesus is speaking to the hard-hearted religious leaders of the land. Uh, this really is such an important passage just for the whole purpose of John's gospel, he writes so that we may believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Uh, here is Jesus expressing his sonship, these hard-hearted religious leaders. They've rejected his claims. The idea is that they would believe they're not believing. Uh, we see that even in verse 40, you are unwilling to come to me. So it's an important passage for the skeptic. It's also an important passage for those who already believe. This confirms our faith. This shows that Jesus is indeed who he claims to be. This gives us talking points for that skeptic in our life. So here Jesus is defending his sonship. He's defending his identity as God in human flesh. I'm going to read the whole passage. We have not read the whole passage it's in its entirety for the last few weeks. So I'm going to read that. Start in verse 31. Jesus says, if I alone testify about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who testifies of me, and I know that the testimony which he gives about me is true. You have sent to John, and he has testified to the truth. But the testimony which I receive is not from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He, John, was the lamp that was burning and was shining, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John, for the works which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do testify about me, that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me, he has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. You do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe him whom he sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify of me. And you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. Here's how we've been unpacking this passage over the last few weeks. We're looking at it like a courtroom scene. That's the picture John is painting for us. Eleven times in ten verses, you have those words testify or testimony. It's all courtroom language, legal terminology. This is defense attorney verbiage. Testify, testimony. And it is here in the midst of this great hostility that Jesus now calls witnesses to take the stand in his defense before his rejectors. Jesus is adhering to the Old Testament judicial precedent by the mouth of two or three, a case, a matter shall be confirmed. So he's moving from this work of evangelism. In verses 19 through 30, I am the Son. Come to me. Believe in me. Believe my word. Believe he who sent me. He's moving from evangelism to now apologetics. He's offering evidence that confirms he is who he claimed to be. He's here the master apologist. Now, we've been working our way through. We've seen the first two witnesses already. First two witnesses already. Witness number one was in verse 32. The greatest prophet who ever lived. The greatest prophet who ever lived. He takes the stand. This is John the Baptist. He's the eyewitness. He's the forerunner prophesied in the Old Testament. The last and greatest Old Testament prophet. What's his testimony? 
What did he say? Chapter 1, I myself have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. Look at verse 35. At the very end, Jesus says that even the enemies were willing to rejoice in his message, even for a time. It's just damning evidence against the accusers here. You believed John. You accepted John, yet you reject me? He pointed to me. That was witness number one. We saw witness number two last week, the greatest display of miracles ever to be performed. The greatest display of miracles ever to be performed. As strong as John the Baptist's testimony was and is, Verse 36, Jesus says, the testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John. It's greater how? More powerful how? Stronger. Because John's testimony is what one person saw. But now Jesus says, ask the crowds. Even ask one another. You've all seen my miraculous works. John chapter 2 you have Jesus who came into Jerusalem around Passover. Remember, millions of people have descended upon the city of Jerusalem during Passover. And it says that he performed signs, many signs. Nicodemus comes to him and says, no one can do the signs which you have done. In fact, Nicodemus' testimony shows that these were indeed true miracles, true miracles. He's healed the nobleman's son at this point. He saved Peter's mother-in-law from a life-threatening fever. He's cast a demon out of somebody in a synagogue. On and on it goes. He's healed a leper. He's told that leper, go to the religious leaders, show them. Show them your skin. Show that it's been restored. You have been healed. And even on this day, this day, he performed a miracle in verse 8, 5, 8. Jesus said to the man, lame for 38 years, get up, pick up your pallet, and walk. Miracle after miracle performed. Witnessing, witnessing that he is fulfilling messianic prophecy. Confirming he is who he claimed to be. All have seen it. Even these rejectors. So again, it's powerful testimony, the greatest display of miracles ever to be performed. We developed that last week. Now, we come to the third and final testimony here. Third and final testimony. Could Jesus have stopped here? Absolutely. Absolutely. Two witnesses, Old Testament, judicial precedents. But no, he's going to bring a third. Why? By the mouth of two or three. It's the greatest legal standard here. So he calls a third witness to take the stand. This is the greatest witness, the most weighty witness. Think of Matlock. Remember Matlock? That was a great show, wasn't it? Matlock. Think of Perry Mason. They all wait till that final scene of the show, right? All you have to do is watch the last five minutes. But the final scene of the show, they call that final witness, that clinching testimony, and all of it seals the case for them. That's what Jesus does here. Look at verse 37. He calls his father to take the stand. Verse 37, and the father who sent me, he has testified of me. You can't get much stronger testimony, can you? This is the father. This is the ruler of Israel. This is the creator of the world. This is the very one these religious leaders claim to worship and even lead others to worship. I'm going to call the Father to the stand. On the surface, we might think Jesus is referring to the Father's words at his baptism. Remember, the Father says, this is my beloved Son. Again, that's great testimony. That's not the testimony Jesus is referring to. How do we know that? Look at the next phrase. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. I'm not talking about my father's words at my baptism. That was John's testimony. He confirmed that. I'm not talking about the heavens being torn open, the, 
the Spirit descending upon me. I'm not talking about that. You've never heard him. You have not heard his voice. No, the witness here is superior to any audible word from heaven or any vision from God one man might have been given. What's the testimony? Uh, Think about this in your apologetic life. When you persuade men to believe, that is our calling. When you persuade others, what is the most powerful testimony, strongest testimony to Jesus' identity? Look at verse 39. You search the what? Scriptures. You search the Scriptures. In verse 38, he refers to the Scriptures as his Father's word, his word. You search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. You are right. You are right. But eternal life comes only through me. It is these that testify about me, confirm me, corroborate my witness, bear witness to me. Here's the third witness that is called to the stand, the greatest revelation ever to be inspired. The greatest revelation ever to be inspired. He's referring here to the Old Testament scriptures. And why are they? Why are they the strongest testimony to Jesus' identity because of their very nature. This is testimony in written form. It's like an affidavit. This is objective, outside-of-us testimony. Once it's written down, you can't change it. You can't manipulate it. It can't be molded into what you want it to say. Words mean words. They mean something. There's a context. It's verifiable. Right? I can disregard what one person may have seen. Say, oh, that was just your own imagination. I can explain it away, thinking maybe you've just gotten it wrong. You didn't see it right. But once that's recorded and verified and written, shown to be historical, confirmed, documented testimony, you cannot disregard it. You cannot cast it aside. It's there. You need to deal with the evidence. It's even more true in this case. Documentation that comes from God the Father himself. The inspired scriptures. Now, this is a similar point. Similar point to what Peter makes in 2 Peter chapter 1. Listen to what Peter writes. He writes this. For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We were there. We saw it. Peter's talking about the transfiguration. We were on the mountain. We saw everything. We saw Jesus pull back the veil of his humanity, show show his glory. We were there. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And we heard the Father speak. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We heard it. So we saw something. We heard something. We were eyewitnesses. Verse 18, and we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. We were there. We were there. But now watch what Peter does next. He says this, don't just believe the glory of Christ because of our eyewitness testimony. That's not enough. It's strong, yes. It's true, yes. It's weighty. But eyewitness testimony can be fallible, right? can be fallible. So then why believe the glory of Christ? Why? What does Peter say? Because, verse 19, because we have the what? The prophetic word. That's why you believe this. We have the prophetic word. We have the more sure word of the Father. The inscripturated word. It's been verified. It's been confirmed. 
And Peter says this, speaking of the prophetic word, to which you do well to pay attention. It's a lamp shining in a dark place. It's confirmed. It's testimony outside of us. It's historical. It's documented. Why is it so powerful? Verse 21. Here's theology now. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. No, it's been breathed out by God. Men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Don't just believe our eyewitness testimony. Believe the scriptures. That's the more weightier, the weightier testimony. It's powerful testimony of the scriptures. It identifies Jesus. It predicted him, this prophetic word, predicted him, pointed to him. It pictured him. It even prophesied the details of him. And so Jesus says here to these religious leaders, do you want to know who I am? Do you want to know who I am? What is the greatest apologetic evidence? You need to look to the scriptures. You need to look to the prophetic word. The Father's given that to you. Amazing. These were the guardians of the scriptures. He says, you don't even know the scriptures. You need to look again at them. Now look at verse 37. Verse 37. Notice, Jesus says this. The Father, the Father has testified. The Father has testified of me. Testified, perfect tense. Here's what this means. The Father has testified me in the past, but that testimony remains now. It's just as powerful now as it was then. He says these are not dead words. The scriptures are not dead words. Right? They're alive. They're convicting words. If there is that skeptic in your life, bring them to the scriptures. How is one born from above? When the Spirit uses His Word to change the heart, bring Him to the Scriptures. And again, Jesus is speaking to those who are the guardians of the Scriptures, at least supposed to be. They interpreted the Old Testament. So here's what Jesus is doing. He's entering their turf, their turf. He's entering their realm of expertise. Let's bring it to courtroom language again today. This final witness would be what is called a hostile witness, a hostile witness, to witness against the prosecution. A hostile witness should confirm what the prosecution is claiming, but doesn't. Hostile witness actually substantiates the defendant's claims. So Jesus is just masterful. I'm entering on your terms, on your turf, search the scriptures. So here's the question we need to answer. How does the Old Testament confirm Jesus is the Son of God? How does the Old Testament scriptures testify in Jesus' words about me? What should these religious leaders have known? What should they have recognized about Christ? So we're going to delve into this. Twelve Old Testament prophecies. Don't worry, we're not going through all today. Twelve Old Testament prophecies that confirm Jesus' identity as the Messiah, Son of God. Twelve of them. There's many more. In fact, there's 48 specific prophecies of the coming Messiah. Specific. There's pictures, there's others, but 48 specific prophecies, we'll look at 12 of them. Six of these prophecies we'll look at are fulfilled during Jesus' life. And then six will be fulfilled in his death. Six in his life, six in his death. We'll look at the ones fulfilled in his life this morning, and then next week it makes sense as we prepare for the Lord's Supper. We'll look at those he fulfills in his death. Let's jump right in. What should these religious leaders have known? How do the scriptures testify of Jesus? Prophecy number one. Prophecy number one. Jesus' genealogy confirms his sonship. Jesus' genealogy confirms his sonship. There's a reason why there are so many genealogies in the Old Testament. If you're like me, right, back in the day, we would skip over the genealogies, right? Never today. But we would skip over the genealogies. We think, we thank the Lord for them. 
right? They allow us to catch up on our yearly Bible reading, right? You miss a day and just kind of skip through. We think of genealogies as irrelevant, boring. They're not. They're not. They're there by design. So key. Here's the reason for the genealogies throughout the Old Testament. They're there because there's a promise that God has given. The promise is in Genesis 3.15. Here's the promise. That a seed, a descendant, a son of a woman would one day come, would one day be born. And that descendant, that seed would crush the serpent, Satan on the head. It's the first promise of hope in the Bible. This is the proto-evangel, the first gospel. It comes in the midst of sin. You have the fall of man. But God in grace, he promises his creation something. He promises them a seed, a representative. A seed through which mankind would be saved from his guilt, delivered from Satan's grip. A seed through which God would bestow blessing upon the world. A seed who would one day die for his people. The seed who would one day rule in peace and righteousness. The promised Messiah, the promised seed, the promised Son of God. And here's what happens as you work your way through, starting in Genesis 3.15. You find this promised seed is progressively narrowed. Narrowed. As the story unfolds, you move to Genesis 9, 26. The seed promise is said to come through the line of Shem, Noah's son. Genesis 12, you have the identity of the seed narrowed to the line of Abraham. In Genesis 21, 12, the seed is narrowed through the line of Isaac. Genesis 28, the seed comes from the line of Jacob. Genesis 49, the seed comes to the line of Judah. 2 Samuel, you then have the promised seed coming through the line of David, the Davidic covenant. It's the seed promise from Genesis 3. Again, that seed is progressively narrowed. Now, how does this relate to Jesus? Why does this matter? Well, this is exactly Jesus' family lineage. Exactly. Exactly. So Luke records this in great detail. It's all by design. Luke 3 writes this. When he, Jesus, began his ministry, Jesus himself was about 30 years of age, being, here's the key word, as was supposed, the son of Joseph. It looked like he was the son of Joseph, but he's not the son of Joseph. What Luke does here is he gives us Jesus' lineage through Mary, through Mary not Joseph. Matthew gives the lineage through Joseph. But here, Luke is recording the actual human ancestry through Mary. Well, how perfect does this match up? Listen to Luke's genealogy that he gives. Mary is the descendant of Eli. He then skips many generations. Speaking of the fathers here, the son of Malaya, the son of Mena, the son of Nathan, And then you have this, the son of David. Just going to work his way back, the son of David. So the promised seed, 2 Samuel 7. In verse 33, you then have the son of Ram, the son of Hezron, the son of Perez. And then you have this, the son of Judah, Genesis 49. You then have this, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, Verse 36, he comes then from the son of Shem, that's Shem's lineage, fulfilling Genesis 9. And then he brings it all the way back and he says, he then comes from the son of Adam, the promise given in Genesis 3, 15. He's the one who would crush Satan on the head. And then he ends with this. This then is the lineage of the son of God. He has the right genealogy as the promised Messiah son. And what's significant about this, significant, is that no one ever questioned Jesus' lineage. No one. 
all the religious leaders would have to do is show that Jesus failed the genealogical test. That's it. If he failed that, it's done. He's not the Messiah. He's not the son. They could have easily showed, showed that Jesus did not have the right genealogy. Why? They kept all of the genealogies. They're all in Jerusalem. No doubt they tried, no avail. And so Jesus says, first and foremost, look to the scriptures. You who hate me, you who reject me, the very scriptures you have been called to guard and protect and interpret, they testify about me. They show I have the right genealogy of the promised son. In fact, look at verse 46, chapter 5, verse 46 in John. Notice what Jesus says, for if you believed Moses, bring it all the way back. If you believed Moses, you would believe me. Why? For he wrote about me. He prophesied about me. You see that all the way through Genesis, the right lineage from Adam to Shem to Abraham to Judah, ultimately through David. All of it confirms. All of it confirmed. You should know me. You should recognize me. It's the first prophecy, prophecy number two. Jesus' conception and birth confirms his sonship. Not only his genealogy, but his conception and birth confirms his sonship. As you work your way through the Old Testament, what you find is that this coming seed is a special seed. A special seed. Special not only because of his identity, he's going to share the same nature as Yahweh, that's special. But special because of his conception, his conception, special seed conceived in a miraculous way. This is the prophecy of Isaiah 7, Isaiah 7. Speaking of this coming ruler, this ruler, the son who would be given to Israel, Isaiah says this, Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, Matthew in chapter 1 picks up on this. He says, Jesus' conception birth fulfills Isaiah 7, 14. But Luke also refers back to this prophecy. Remember, Gabriel comes to Mary They have a conversation in Luke chapter 1. Mary said to the angel, how can this be? Uh, Gabriel has said, you're going to conceive. Mary, how can this be since I am a virgin? That's the echo. That's the connection to Isaiah 7. The angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason... The holy child shall be called what? The son of God. The virgin conception necessary, necessary. If the child is going to share the same nature as God the father. So Matthew connects it. Luke here connects it. But the significant thing is this. The religious leaders knew about this conception and birth. They knew the virgin conception of Jesus. At least they knew the report of it. And they rejected it, rejected it. They knew that Joseph never claimed to be the biological father of Jesus. They knew this. How do we know? Listen to these statements. They said to him, they said to Jesus, we were not born of fornication. We know who our father is. You don't. Or Mark 6, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary? That's not how you usually talk about a son in that culture. It's not the son of the mother, it's the son of the father. No, he's the son of Mary. We don't know who his father is. So the religious leaders knew that Joseph wasn't the father. And no doubt they heard Mary's explanation as to why. Again, Another statement in John 9, as for this man, we do not know where he is from. We don't know his father. But now remember, 
not only did these religious leaders hear Mary's explanation of Jesus' conception, but they, the religious leaders, were given a sign confirming Mary's explanation. Remember what that sign was? Remember Mary's cousin Elizabeth? She was old in years, right? And she conceived a child. Gabriel says that's impossible in her old age. That sign was given. Who's Elizabeth's husband? It's Zacharias. Who is he? He's a priest. And at that time, he was a priest who served in the temple in Jerusalem. It's where the Sanhedrin is located. He serves there during the conception and birth of John the Baptist and Jesus. If you look back at Luke 1, this is the very priest who refers to Jesus as the Lord, Yahweh, Yahweh. That was the testimony of Zacharias to the religious leaders. They saw it. They saw the miracle even then. And you can be sure these religious leaders heard the report of the virgin conception. They heard about the conversation Mary has with Gabriel. They witnessed this miracle of Elizabeth's conception of John, the very one who says he is, Jesus is the Son of God. And all they had to do, all they had to do was find Jesus' earthly father. That's it. Again, everything crumbles, but they can't. He does not have an earthly father. He didn't exist. But they saw the miracle. They saw the confirmation. And still they reject him. We don't want you. Jesus fulfilled the conception and birth prophecy of the Messiah's son. Prophecy number three. Prophecy number three. Jesus' place of birth confirms his sonship. His place of birth. And just notice here, Jesus had nothing to do with these first three prophecies coming to fruition. He had nothing to do with it. He's all passive here. Others are fulfilling these prophecies on his behalf. And it's not just one of these prophecies that confirm Jesus. It's all of them. All of them are true in his life. But the Old Testament is clear. Where would this promised son, this Messiah, be born? Answer, the little town of Bethlehem. Why do we sing that song? Because of Micah 5. But as for you, Bethlehem, too little to be among the clans of Judah. It's in Bethlehem. From you, one will go forth for me to be the ruler in Israel. He's going to be born in Bethlehem. And who would this ruler be? This ruler would be none less than God in human flesh. He's born in Bethlehem. That's human nature. But continue the prophecy. His goings forth, the one born, his goings forth are from long ago. How long? From the days of eternity. It's a special son. A special king. Yes, he will be born, but he's eternal. He's self-sufficient. It's an attribute of God alone. Uh, Jesus claimed this for himself. All the way back, or even on this day in John chapter 5, he claimed it back for himself. He said, for just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave the Son to have life in himself. Self-sufficiency, eternality. And Micah 5 says, this coming Son will be eternal, born yet eternal. Eternal. And then verse 3, here's the prophecy continuing. Therefore, he, Yahweh, will give them up. Speaking of Israel here, watch. Until the time when she, a specific woman, when she who is in labor has born a child. Who's that woman? That's the virgin of Isaiah 7.14. That's Mary. It's Mary. It's all incarnation language. This child will be eternal God, self-sufficient, yet born. That's why he's Emmanuel, God with us. But here's the point from Micah 5. The promised ruler's birthplace was clearly identified. The genealogy, the conception, now the birthplace. It's called by name. It would be in Bethlehem. And once again, the religious leaders knew this. No question in their mind. 
Listen to Matthew 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem. And they say, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Where is he? We're looking for him. We saw his star in the east. We've come to worship him. He's God. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. And all Jerusalem with him. So he gathers together all the chief priests and the scribes of the people. These are the people who stand before Jesus on this day. These were the skeptics in Jesus' day, the chief priests. And Herod inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. Verse 5, they said to him, no delay, no delay. We know, we know the prophecy. They said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea. He, they quote Micah 5. For this is what has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, you're by no means least. A ruler will come forth. They know where the Messiah will be born. They know where the son will be given. Uh, turn over to John 7. Look at John 7, verse 42. Not only did the religious leaders know this, the people knew this. John 7, 42, you have the people hearing Jesus' words. This certainly is the prophet. That's verse 40. And now verse 42. Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the descendants of David. They know the genealogy. And from Bethlehem, the village where David was. They know this. They know this. Amazing. Jesus should not have been born in Bethlehem. Should not have been born. At least if that was up to Mary, right? I mean, she has a few days to give birth. And here's Joseph's idea. I want to take a trip. And you're going to travel by donkey. Mary's like, what have I done with this guy? 70 miles south, they come to Bethlehem. Why? Caesar Augustus issues a decree. If it's up to them, he's not born there. But this is God fulfilling, orchestrating world history for this messianic prophecy. He was born in the prophesied place of the Messiah's son. And then you move into Jesus' life. That's all before Jesus is even born. Now you're in his life. We have a fourth prophecy Jesus fulfills. Prophecy number four. Jesus' miracle power confirms his sonship. His miracle power. We looked at this last week. Isaiah says, when the Messiah comes, when the Son arrives, on that day, the deaf will hear. Miracles will abound. And out of their gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind will see. Isaiah 35, say to those with anxious heart, take courage, fear not. Why? Behold, your God will come. That's incarnation. The Son is coming. How do you know when he arrives? Verse 5, the eyes of the blind will be opened. The ears of the deaf will be unstopped. The lame will leap like a deer. We see Jesus do that. We see Jesus do that on this very day. He fulfills that prophecy with the lame man. It's happening right in front of the religious leaders, yet they are unwilling, unwilling to come to him. They don't want that Messiah. Jesus says, look at the scriptures. Look at the scriptures. They testify of me. Nicodemus confirmed it in chapter 3, verse 2. Nicodemus, the teacher of Israel, says no one can do these signs unless God is with him. Now look over at John 11. Watch this. John 11, you have the religious leaders. This is after Jesus resurrects Lazarus. Look at verse 47, John eleven forty-seven. Therefore, the chief priests and the Pharisees convened a council. The very ones who reject Jesus in John 5, they convene a council. <clears throat> and they say, what are we doing? What are we doing? 
For this man is performing what? Many signs. They've seen it. They confirm it. Verse 48, if we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him. We can't let that happen. Why? What's driving them? It's this. The Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. We want to be in charge. We don't want the ruler to reign over us. Again, Jesus says, look at the scriptures. The miracles, they testify of me. Prophecy number five. Prophecy number five. Jesus is teaching authority confirms his sonship. Jesus' teaching authority confirms his sonship. When Jesus comes, the religious leaders, the crowds, they're shocked at his teaching. Shocked. Mark 1 says they were all amazed so that they debated among themselves, what is this? A new teaching with authority. That news spreads everywhere throughout Galilee. It was wisdom they had never seen before, irrefutable insight into God's word. Matthew 7, when Jesus had finished these words, the crowd were amazed at his teaching. Why? He was teaching them as one having authority, not as the scribes. He didn't quote any rabbi. Instead, he says, I say to you. And the religious leaders are dumbfounded. What do we make of this guy? So much so, they don't even know what to do with him when Jesus is 12 years old. That's a problem. They're in the temple. John 7, 15, they're astounded, astonished. How has this man become learned? He's never even been taught. Well, the Old Testament tells us. Isaiah 11 says when the Messiah arrives... A distinguishing mark would be the spirit of the Lord resting on him. The spirit, here it is, of wisdom and understanding. He'd have the spirit of counsel, the spirit of knowledge. He would teach as no man ever taught. He would teach in the power of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus in Luke chapter 4 is in the synagogue. He quotes that prophecy, and he says, today this is being fulfilled in your hearing. He claimed it for himself. He was given the Spirit without measure, and so his teaching is unexplainable. It's filled with authority. So much more on these last few. Let me just mention number one, or one more. Prophecy number six. Prophecy number six. Jesus' sinless life confirms his sonship. Jesus' sinless life confirms his sonship. Who would the Messiah be? Who would the son be? Isaiah 9 says he would be mighty God. Isaiah 10 refers that to the Holy One of God. Jeremiah 23 says this, he will be a righteous branch. He says that the Messiah, the Son, would be the Lord, our righteousness. Malachi, the Son of righteousness. What will set the Messiah apart from every other human being ever? It's his righteousness, his holiness. Sinless perfection, moral purity. Isaiah 11 says, with righteousness he will judge. Righteousness will be a belt about his waist. And he's not just righteous, he's our righteousness. So much righteousness he can give it to others. Isaiah 53 makes this prophecy, there will be no deceit in his mouth. An amazing statement because out of the heart, what? The mouth speaks. All the religious leaders had to do, all they had to do was find one sin in the life of Jesus, just one. I asked the equipping class this morning, how long would it take for somebody to find one sin in your life? They had 33 years to find just one sin, one. If they find one, everything comes crumbling down. 
Look at John 8. This is a challenge that Jesus makes. John chapter 8, verse 46. Here's the challenge. He offers the religious leaders. Listen to what he says. Which one of you, which one of you convicts me of sin? Just find one sin. That's the challenge. Find one sin. Is there any unrighteousness in me, Jesus says? And look at verse 48. The religious leaders say this. The Jews said to him, do we not rightly say that you are a Samaritan? What? It's not even the point. It's idiocy. Find one sin in me. They can't. They can't. It's the overwhelming testimony of the life of Christ. Even the demons say he is the holy one of God. Pilate says, I find no guilt in this man. This is exactly what Jesus said in John 5, 19. I only do what the Father does. Sinless perfection. Are you beginning to understand how powerful this final witness is? It's all confirmed. It's all documented. You search the scriptures, verse 39. You search the scriptures. It is these that testify about me. That's just six prophecies. That's a sampling but when you come to the death of Jesus, amazingly, the death of Jesus, the prophetic fulfillment is even more astounding. We'll look at that next week. But for now, understand Jesus is who he claimed to be. He is the audacious claim, God in human flesh. He's the only savior from sin. He's the one, Genesis 3 says, will crush Satan on the head. He's the one who will one day rule and reign forever. How do we know this? What confirms this? He fulfilled Old Testament prophecy, prophesied genealogy, prophesied conception, prophesied place of birth, prophesied miracle working power, prophesied teaching authority, and prophesied sinlessness. This is the Father's, the Father's testimony to His own Son. Father, you have not left us in the dark about the identity of Jesus Christ. Yet, Lord, even here we see the religious leaders, they still reject him. That would have been us if your spirit didn't give us eyes to see your glory in his face. Pray that you grant us a love for him that you would deepen our worship of your Son, that you would give us a boldness to speak about him. Allow us to bring others to your testimony, to the scriptures. We pray that people would be saved, delivered out of their sin into life. Pray this in Christ's name. Amen.